Hey, what's up? My name is Mr. Hanish and welcome to my flipped classroom. Today we're continuing our series on all the important things we should know about a country when we study it. And I'm not going to lie, this one's going to be a little bit more lengthy because we have so many examples. But before we start, I want you to imagine something. Imagine a world with no governments. There are no rules, no laws, no regulations, nobody telling you what you can and cannot do. Imagine a school with no superintendent, no principal, no teachers. What would you do? How would you act? If you imagine this scenario and started getting really excited at all the possibilities, I don't know if you've quite thought this scenario all the way through. If you imagine this scenario and got really scared, I think you're well on your way to understanding the importance of government in our lives. Sometimes governments can seem like they get in the way and restrict our freedom or punish us when they shouldn't. And I admit, many governments throughout history have done this. However, I think it's equally important for us to understand that a lot of people could die if there was no government or if there was a state of anarchy. With anarchy and no rules and laws, people would be fighting each other for scraps of meat in the street to survive. Except, I already found a couple problems with even that scenario. One, the meat would probably be unsafe because there was no agency created to inspect it and make sure it met health standards. And two, what streets would they be fighting in? There's no highway department to build them. Now, sure, we could also assume that since we are kind, loving, good-natured human beings, that we would still look out for one another and avoid the temptation to fight over silly things like food. But to illustrate my point, it's time for a segment I like to call Analogy Time with Mr. Hanich. For this analogy, I'll give you a real-life example, the National Basketball Association. It happens every fall, winter, and spring, and actually gives us a good idea of why governments are so important. See, the NBA, even though it's just a simple basketball league designed mostly to entertain us, actually teaches us some very important lessons about government. The NBA is run by a commissioner named David Stern. Now, David Stern knows that to keep order during basketball games, there have to be rules and regulations. That's why each game has referees who are assigned the job of enforcing the NBA's rules and regulations. During most games, the referees act as a pretty effective government. If a player gets hit on the arm when he's shooting, the referee makes sure the player that hit him is penalized with a foul, and the player that got hit is rewarded with free throws. However, there are times that anarchy reigns in the NBA and good governing goes right out the window. Now, usually when a player takes five steps without dribbling, the referee enforces the rule of traveling and gives the ball to the other team. Usually when a player with the ball runs over a defender, the referee once again penalizes that person, gives the ball to the other team. Usually when a player argues with the decisions of the referee, the referee gives them a technical foul and not only gives the ball to the other team, but lets them shoot free throws too. Sadly, during NBA games that LeBron James takes part in, these rules are not always enforced. These rules are not ever enforced. So LeBron James plays in a state of anarchy where none of the rules apply to him. This is a situation where anarchy can be good for some people, like LeBron James, but only because everyone else has to play by those rules. Imagine if everyone on the court played in a state of anarchy. So it's clear that, especially in the real world, government is pretty important. But not every government runs the exact same way, so it's important that we'll take a look at all the different styles and types of governments that we'll be encountering. Now, there are a lot of different governments out there. We can't hit every single one, but we'll go through some of the more common ones that you'll be encountering more often this school year. The first form of government we'll look at is maybe the one you're most familiar with, democracy. The thing that all democracies or democratic governments have in common is the people hold the power to choose their leaders. 
but it's not always that simple. In, right here in the U.S., for instance, we are also considered a republic, which means that once we choose our leaders, we allow them to make certain decisions for us, or, as has been the case lately, to argue with each other and make no decisions at all. Am I right? Am I right? The U.S. formed its democratic republic after getting fed up with being run by the British government style at the time, which is a monarchy. A monarchy is where one monarch is the head of the country and makes all decisions and laws. Gosh, that's an awful lot of power to be put in the hands of a butterfly. <laughs> Cheesy jokes. True monarchies are becoming more and more rare to find, and many of these have become constitutional monarchies, where the monarch has to follow a written constitution that keeps their power in check, or parliamentary monarchies. Parliamentary monarchies are where the parliament, which is elected by the people, much like our Congress, makes decisions and are voted on by the people, kind of like a republic. But there's this monarch hanging around that goes to ribbon cuttings and visits other national leaders around the world and dominates world news coverage when they have a baby. It's just a figurehead. They don't really have the power to make decisions that Parliament has, but they are still seen as a leader. There are plenty of governments that follow in monarchy's footsteps and rely on one leader or a very small group of leaders but without the Constitution or Parliament to offset their power. When a small group of elite, powerful people run the country, it's called an oligarchy. Oligarchy was seen around the world much more frequently in the past than today because now countries favor governments where all people can make decisions, like a democracy, or the elite few in the oligarchy struggle against each other for power until there is only one leader left standing form of government where only one leader is left standing, and it's called a dictatorship, where, much like an old school monarch, all the decisions and laws and rules are created by only one person. Dictators usually become famous for the wrong reasons, because all that power starts to go to their head, and many have ended up taking it out on their own people. They turn their dictatorship into what is called an authoritarian or totalitarian government, meaning the government forces its wishes on its people and it controls not just the laws of the country but also the economy and the culture as well. One type of government that is quite prone to having totalitarian dictators is socialism. The idea of socialism is that the central government does all the economic planning and producing and distributing and it can do it equally, so nobody is given any more than anyone else. If elements of socialism are mixed with a democracy or republic, it can be very successful, as it has been in countries like Sweden, and Norway, and Finland, where the government provides health care and daycare and other family-oriented services for its people on an equal basis. In these countries, people can still choose their leaders and have a great deal of freedom in other areas. But, socialist governments have tended to also take on the form of communism, which starts with that same central government control over the economy, but has the end goal to set up a completely classless equal society where eventually no one has any private ownership. Now this sounds good, but the problem is that the people in power, i.e. the totalitarian dictator and their cronies, are never really interested in joining that classless equal society once they have a taste of power. And like Joseph Stalin did in the Soviet Union, or Pol Pot did in Cambodia, they end up killing millions of their own people to keep themselves in power. Another form of government with very little input from the people has become very popular in the Middle East and North Africa recently, and it's called a theocracy. The basis of a theocracy is following religious law. So, who physically runs the country in a theocracy then? God? Well, no, a religious leader acts as the head of the government and interprets the laws from their religion to apply to the laws of the country. Recently, a lot of them have morphed into what is considered an Islamic Republic, which is sort of a combination of Islam, the religion or theocracy aspect for those countries since most of their people do follow Islam, 
and also a republic where representatives elected by the people are there to make laws. However, those laws still must reflect their religion, so it's not a true combination, because even though they're electing people, those people can only follow and create certain types of laws, so it's still limited. Now, one critical thing to keep in mind is that no two governments are exactly the same. Looking at the style of government definitely gives us a hint at how that country's people relate with their government as well as each other. It may not tell us the whole story, but it is an important part of the puzzle that we need to consider. The other important thing we need to consider is that all the government styles that we've talked about today aren't even close to all of the government styles that are out there. So for now, go study, and until next time, bye bye